In today's gospel reading, St. Peter comes to our Lord and says, Lord, if a brother or sister sins against me, how often would I forgive as many as seven times? When St. Peter asks this question, he's actually manifesting great generosity. In other words, to forgive someone seven times if they sin against you is being very generous. But our Lord says, no, 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 not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Now, by this, it's really what it implies is an infinite number of times. In other words, you should be willing to forgive again and again and again. So, in other words, we should not hold on to unforgiveness. And this is especially so in regards to offenses against ourselves. So, often people are offended. We are all offended at times. And we hold on to a grudge. We dislike the person. We judge the person. And sometimes there's a desire for, for vengeance, to try to pay the person back, to, to hurt that person because of what they have done to us. And this is very, very detrimental for our well-being, and certainly for our own salvation. There are many, many passages in the Gospels where our Lord addresses this lack of forgiveness as being an obstacle to our salvation. He says, the measure we use will be the measure that we get. Unless we forgive, we cannot be forgiven. Now the parable that our Lord gives to St. Peter, and I think he probably mentioned this parable in the presence of all his disciples, and this is why it's recorded in, in St. Matthew. Nevertheless, it was a parable that was um, you know, recited to other people as well. And the, the, the amounts that are mentioned, you know, there's this uh, king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. Notice the word slaves. Not his noblemen, but slaves. So slaves are very poor to begin with. Okay? So it's worth, worth knowing that. But one slave owes him 10,000 talents. How much is 10,000 talents? There's, there's some dispute as to what that actually referred to or how much that would be in today's standards. But basically, one talent, okay, this is 10,000 talents, one talent would be the equivalent of roughly 33 grams of gold or silver at the time that this was taking place. So that's a huge amount. And 10,000 talents is like, we're talking millions of dollars in today's uh, currency or billions of dollars. So there's no way a slave, or in fact anyone, could ever repay that amount. But if you notice, the, the king has mercy, he has, he has compassion, and he says, okay, I, I will forgive you, right? But that same slave, he goes out and he comes across a, his fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii. What is a denarii? A denarii is a day's wage. So in today's standards, let's just say a day's wage is a hundred dollars. So a hundred denarii, uh, if I'm correct, is ten thousand dollars. Which is difficult. Most people wouldn't have that kind of money offhand, but it's something that you could pay off. You know, people buy cars, they have to uh, pay off their car for a number of years. So it's something that's reasonably payable. But this slave has no mercy at all for his fellow slave who owes him a small amount compared to the amount that he owed the king. And what is the point that our Lord is trying to make? The point that he's trying to make is that our offenses against God are infinite. And there's no way conceivable, no way possible that any human being could pay the debt that we owe to God for our sins, for our mortal sins. And this is why only God can repay this amount. So Jesus Christ is fully man and he's fully God. So because he's God, he can have infinite charity. And by his sufferings, he can pay off the amount. And because he's man, he's one of, our, one of us. He represents all of us. He's taken all of us, reunited all of us to him. All of our sins taken upon himself. So he's able to pay off that debt. And so we are able to be forgiven. So he actually pays the debt, the infinite debt. So God has forgiven us such a great amount, but we are not willing to forgive our 
fellow human beings, sometimes even siblings, for their offense against us. And often these, this lack of unforgiveness or disputes within families, often it's because of the inheritance, it squabbles about money. In other words, you know, even if it's a large amount of money, like, I don't know, let's say thousands of dollars or property, what's more important, that property or your eternal salvation? And what these people are saying, no, that, that property is not important. Now, yes, it's true, sometimes it is difficult to forgive. Sometimes we need to ask God to help us to forgive. And a good sign that you have forgiven is that you are able to pray for those who have offended you. Pray that God will bless them. If they have done something wrong towards you, if they have offended you, leave justice to God. God will punish them. They will have to spend time in purgatory for their sin. So leave justice to God. There's no need for us to act like God and to say, okay, I'm going to punish this person by not talking to them or wishing them harm or things like that. No. Leave justice to God. Now, when it comes to forgiveness, I think it's fair to point out that we have to be careful to read things in context. So if we take this passage out of context, we can easily make a mistake. You know, let's say you're in a relationship, maybe a husband and wife relationship, and let's say the husband is abusing the wife. Should she just keep forgiving? And the answer is no. So sometimes when there is injustice, depending on the level of injustice, we have to speak out against injustice. And sometimes the innocent party, they have to remove themselves from a situation where the abuse is ongoing. And this is important to realize. So we have to take this passage in, in context of other passages where our Lord says, you know, we need to speak out against injustice. So if you read the Beatitudes, at the end there, our Lord says something like, uh, uh, blessed are you uh, for righteousness' sake and, uh, you know, uh, for the sake of justice, so we will be persecuted. But part of the reason I mention this is because, you know, we've had priest scandals in the church and often the, the bishops have been criticized, and, and rightly so. But imagine if a bishop were just to take this passage and apply it to the situation. Well, a priest comes to me and uh, he's been accused of, you know, abusing minors or whatever, and uh, well, our Lord says to forgive him. So yes, I forgive him, and puts him in another parish and the priest abuses again. And how many times is the bishop to forgive him? So, of course, it's not a good situation. Now, here's an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know, is that part of the problem with these repeat priests wasn't just that the bishop was forgiving them and giving them another chance, but that the psychologists, the psychiatrists of the, of, at the time, you know, a lot of these abuses, abuses occurred in the 60s, 70s. It's basically the sexual revolution, um, you know, with this, uh, and especially after the Second Vatican Council, people just went wild. Um, but anyways, the psychologists were saying that, you know, with psychology, with treatment, with programs, we can cure these people. So many of the bishops sent these priests to these places, to the psychologists and psychiatrists, believing that they will be cured of their inclination to abuse. And of course they were not. But it took the bishops a while to realize that. So yeah, that was in the past, and I'm not trying to make excuses, but I'm just trying to take this passage and imagine if somebody just took this passage out of context. Now in the case of the priest abuse, it's not the priest offending against the bishop directly, but offending against minors or, or people who are innocent. So it's a slightly different situation. So yes, we should practice mercy, and, and generosity and be willing to forgive. But that doesn't mean that the problem is gone, that the injustice is gone. So just because someone repents of sin doesn't mean they cease to have the habit of sin. So we need to purify ourselves of that habit. And we do need to speak out against injustice. So in, in you know, according to the guidelines that are present in most dioceses at, at this present time, you know, any abuse, any sexual abuse by a priest is, is considered as very severe and inexcusable. So, uh, 
it's important to be aware of this, this fact. So, once again, I just emphasize we need to read things in context because sometimes when we take things out of context, we can make a mistake. You know, if a bishop's read this, or, well, I'm just going to apply this principle. Yeah, they're going to make a mistake. And yes, mistakes were made. It's very, very unfortunate. And it's also a reminder that, you know, Christ, he paid the eternal punishment for our sin. We're, we're spared the reality of ending up in hell for all eternity. And, and the thing is, you know, this, this servant who has no mercy on his fellow servant, we, we consider so great the offense of someone against ourselves. But when we commit mortal sin, we think, ah, oh, I'll just go to confession. It's not that big of a deal. Do we really realize how great our world sins are? So if we commit a world sin, you know, imagine you, yourself, crucifying our Lord and doing all those terrible things to him, whipping him, scourging him, you know, nailing the nails in his wrists and his feet, putting the crown of thorns on him, spitting on him. Imagine you, yourself, doing that. So every time we commit mortal sin, we crucify our Lord. That's what we're doing. But also imagine, we can't imagine, you know, the, the reality of the separation of God. You know, we speak of hell and normally our Lord, actually our Lord more than anyone else in the New Testament speaks of the reality of hell. I can't remember how many times he mentions it. But he really wants us to think about the reality of hell. And he often describes it in terms of fire. The fire that never burns out. So we know fire is extremely painful. So if you're ever tempted, just place your hand over a flame and hold your hand there as long as you can. And that will certainly change your mind about committing more sin. I'm, I'm not saying you really have to do that, but just try to imagine that. But the real punishment of hell, the real, real pain, the greatest suffering of hell is being deprived of the presence of God. And it's interesting because, you know, I mentioned before that Theologians, scripture scholars point out that there's no one in hell who doesn't want to be there. And they basically hate God, but they also recognize that God is the only source of their happiness. And ever during this lifetime, we think, oh, I'll pursue sexual pleasure or wealth and fame and, and all these things, and it's going to make me happy. But it's not. This is why I always say, look at the lives of the rich and the famous. They're not happy. They have it all, they have everything, they have beautiful partners and, and they, they can do whatever they want, but they're not happy. Many of them are on drugs, many of them commit suicide. So what if you had all the goods in this world? What if you had all the goods in this world for all eternity? Do you think you'll be happy? No. You also need love. But the more selfish we are, the less capable we are of true love. But ultimately, we need the love of God. And God is the one who can fulfill all of our deepest longing, all of our desires. So when we commit a mortal sin, we are basically choosing hell. So the greatest suffering of hell is of being deprived of the presence of God. When we commit mortal sin, we are depriving ourselves of the presence of God. And the point I want to make is we don't realize what a great tearing apart that is. How detrimental it is. I don't even know what, what to compare it to. It would be kind of like, you know, we live in a world where the sun shines, where we have artificial lighting, but imagine being deprived of all light and being in complete darkness. Or, or you know, we have air to breathe. Imagine yourself being deprived of all ability to breathe. Kind of like getting the coronavirus, you know, people have a hard time breathing. So we can't imagine how great it is to be deprived of all these things. And, and the point I wanted to make is that when someone offends against us, that little offense, we think it's so, so great. But when we offend against God, we don't think it's a big deal. Our soul, our repentance is not that great. If someone truly repented, they would not commit the same sin over and over again. Now, yes, sometimes there's things that are contributing factors and habit of sin. Sometimes um, there's genetic dispositions, you know, uh, for various reasons. The way people were formed, also when they were growing up. So there's contributing factors, that's true. But we have to keep in mind that God always gives us sufficient grace 
to be able to avoid falling into mortal sin. And it's important for us to remind ourselves of this fact, because sin is horrible. Sin is a terrible thing, and we often don't realize it. You know, when I was talking to someone the other day about politics and, you know, the, the U.S. politics, and I said the most important thing, whether it's U.S. politics, Canadian politics, is the pro-life issue. And it's kind of like just overlook that. Okay, imagine you performing an abortion, tearing apart that child in the womb. In other words, we need to make real to ourselves what is really happening. It's not just one child, it's in the U.S. It's millions of children are aborted every year. Here in Canada, it's 100,000 children. If we understood the reality of how great an evil this is, we would understand that this is the most important issue. If politicians don't care about the innocent life in the womb, it also means they're not going to care about the elderly, and so they're going to promote euthanasia and assisted suicide, which is what's happening here in the U.S. So why would you ever vote for a politician who doesn't care about human life, which means they don't care about you? This is the most important issue. Everything else falls below that. So sin is a horrible thing, but we've kind of become desensitized to it, and we think it's just a little thing, and we think we can easily go to confession, and yes, we can, and it's a wonderful thing that we can. But we should not forget the price that our Lord had to pay in order that you and I can be forgiven. Amen.